Hello, stand off again. Next speaker, Matthias Maidinger. Honey, I automated the pots uh, and honey pot infrastructure and automation will be covered there. I talk, honey, I automated the pots. So what we're talking about today is um, I want to tell you an entertaining story about honey, infra honey pot infrastructure and automation. So let's jump right in. I'll give you some yeah, technicalities, a bit of intro of uh, how you can do things. And then I'll uh, end up with some fun stuff or also called uh, some fails and, and things I did wrong along the way. So just to make sure to entertain you on the one hand and maybe make sure that you don't run into the same mistakes I did. So just a quick about me, maybe first, I am um, the main person responsible for infrastructure tooling and automation for the labs team at VMRay. So basically, I'm bad at reverse engineering, so I tend to automate things. So yeah, basically, this is what I do for fun. So Honeypots is, is, a, is a kind of a pet project for me. So um, <laughs> please don't yell at my employer, yell at me instead if you're, um, if you have questions or, or even remarks. So as always, this is a thing, uh, or it's a tale of things I'm, I've tried and I am trying, and it's a work in progress. So it's, I'm by no means an expert in doing this. Um, I'm just sharing some stuff along the way that I found interesting or, or important to know. So yeah, the thing is, I want to preserve my honeypot tweaks um, because it's kind of it's it's kind of a cat and mouse game uh, between uh, attackers and honeypot developers in they try to detect your honeypot you customize it more to to try to evade the detection and um, yeah that's why there are relatively few public talks uh, talking about how you deploy honeypots because often people fear that their customizations um, yeah get basically get out in the world and everyone knows about them and all the hard work they put into making the honeypots undetectable is gone. So if you're interested in more details that, than what I'm publicly sharing right now, uh, be sure to hit me up afterwards and talk to me. I'm happy to share this in a more private space maybe. So maybe let's get started with what honeypots are. So generally they tend to emulate things. So either they emulate servers, so that's the majority like SSH servers, MongoDB servers, or even IoT devices, or even mail servers. And the lesser known or lesser used version variant are client honeypots. These are, for example, browsers that try to find drive by downloads or something like that. Generally, honeypots can be um, can be split into three groups. So there are low, medium, and high interaction honeypots, each with their own benefits. So to give you an idea, let's uh, take the example of SSH. So you have uh, the low interaction honeypot for an SSH would be something that is a credential logger basically. So it emulates just the login for an SSH connection and just tries to collect the usernames and passwords people try to log in with. The medium interaction honeypots are quite squishy to define. So they are still scripts, the same as low interaction honeypots, but they try to emulate parts of a system. There is, for example, a cowrie, which is a medium interaction honeypot that doesn't run, that doesn't simulate a full system, but also tries to simulate uh, common commands like, uh, like, um, like disks, uh, free disk space or uh, logged in users or something like that. And then there is the holy grail. There's uh, high interaction honeypots. These emulate a full system. Sticking to the SSH uh, example, there is DocPot, which is running a full Linux, uh, yeah, basically a full Linux system in a, inside a Docker image, and then using a man in the middle proxy to uh, basically record every single command and interaction the attacker tries to uh, tries to do with the system. And you can also tr uh, think of it as an invert pyramid, as in if you look from bottom to top, 
the detail and insight increase. So you start with just logging usernames and passwords and you end up with high interaction honeypots where you can see exactly every command and every system interaction. But that also means uh, that the error potential and the attack surface increase because high interaction honeypots tend to be way more complex than low, medium, low or medium interaction honeypots. So the more complex the system, the more chances for mistakes there are, or even bugs or errors. And as well, uh, finally, the hardware demand and complexity, general system complexity increases. So low interaction honeypots, I mean, it's quite easy to see, low interaction honeypots uh, just are often scripts run by a Python interpreter and high interaction honeypots, something along the lines of Docpot, need a full Docker installation, prepare Docker images, as well as a man in the middle proxy that is dynamically um, that is dynamically managing all the Docker containers and trying to to um, to log everything that happens. So it's just computationally way more complex to do something like that. And then there might be the question of why would you do that? Why would you go through all that trouble of deploying something like this in your network? So there are three main scenarios where honeypots can come in handy. So the first one is to find attackers in your network. So think of it like a, like a trap. So you deploy a honeypot into your internal network and you don't tell anyone that you have deployed this sad system. So there should not be no interaction whatsoever with it because there is no legitimate reason to use the system. So if someone connects to it and tries to, uh, tries to do stuff on it, you can be reasonably sure that someone is snooping around or even actively trying to attack or, or find something in your network. The second thing is, uh, the second use case is you can have, you can use it to get a general grasp of attacks. So get an overview of what's happening outside in the, in the, in the general outside world. So that means something like Citrix or RDP or even credential stuffing. So what are the current attacks that infrastructure that is exposed to the internet is currently experiencing? And that also means you can collect attacker data or at least data from for people that are or systems that are actively scanning the internet so that you can even try to generate uh, some kind of yeah threat intel from it. But that's, I mean, I guess that's the case for another talk. But yeah, finally, then there is the open directories and malware payloads. So what ha tends to happen is if um, if attackers find a system that is open and has, for example, default credentials, they tend to upload things and try to persist their access or do some nefarious thing with your system. And that's the point where honeypots, of course, collect these things and make them available to you. So the attacker has no way of executing this thing on your system, but you get the script or whatever the attacker uploads, uh, uploads to your system, which in turn makes it quite interesting to uh, find novel attacks or even threat actors that are back in business after some time without doing active search by yourself. So this talk is focused on the second and third um, yeah, scenario to, because that's the main reason why I'm uh, running my honeypot infrastructure. So I'm interested in having a look what's happening outside, finding interesting things, or even by chance some new, nice new malware that hopefully no one has seen yet, maybe. So to get this up and running, you will need some kind of deployment. And um, let me tell you, I started with a Raspberry Pi. So some spare old hardware that I've got laying around here, uh, collecting dust up until the point that I decided, I, hey, I can do something nice with this. And I ended up with, um, with a production deployment spanning the globe on multiple virtual prov service providers. 
uh, with quite a lot of infrastructure running right now. So generally you have two main scenarios for your deployment. You have the first scenario of the internal tripwire for checking if something is happening to you. For that scenario, I would recommend deploying your honeypot to your internal network. So somewhere near your production servers. So pr probably maybe even in the same network or near it. So it looks as much as a production system as it can. But if you do this, please do not expose this honeypot to the internet because it's sitting in your production environment network. So possibly with full access already or network level access to, to surrounding systems. So by the way, you, sh you probably should still have some kind of firewalls or access control that forbids active traffic from the honeypot to other systems in your network. If you want to expose the honeypot to the internet, so for scenarios two and three, so collecting data and payloads, I would recommend you deploy your honeypot into a DMZ that is completely separated from the rest of your network. Generally, yeah, I mean, this should consider, be considered best practice, uh, best practice for many services that are uh, exposed to the internet, but with honeypots, it's it's a strong emphasis and strong recommendation to do it like this because honeypots are by design um, systems that look very vulnerable. So they mimic a very valuable target and attract much attention. So let's talk about some deployment best practices maybe. So what you want to have is generally a throwaway system. So consider your honeypot a throwaway system, which means it will be gone, it will be broken, it will be hacked, maybe even, or there will be escapes. So don't use SSH keys, passwords, usernames, anything from your, uh, that would, um, that would allow attackers to uh, correlate this system to the rest of your infrastructure because these things tend to get away. And even, even for the maintenance user that you're using for connection, don't reuse anything you're using on a day-to-day -day basis, please. That also means no root. So especially running, honey, so running anything that's exposed to the internet as root is maybe not the best idea, but especially running honeypots uh, <laughs> would be not the best idea to run as root. And finally, please expect escapes because you are exposing a system that looks vulnerable to the world and it will be vulnerable, but most likely in other ways than you would expect because it still is a piece of software and therefore prone for errors and bugs. So keep that in mind because honeypots still are, yeah, an attacker advantage. So the attacker has um, all the all the infinite ways and time to play around with your system. And you have to only make a mistake once and the attacker has won. So let's talk a bit about how you would deploy such a, th such a system. Because now that we have uh, talked about where to deploy it, maybe it's a good idea to talk about how, because there are things like you can do it manually, of course, but I wouldn't recommend this for a multitude of reasons. I would tend to recommend you to either deploy it via configuration management tools. So something along the lines of Ansible, Puppet or Chef, or even use Docker images. So I have to say uh, not many Honeypots are dockerized. There is um, the telecom security. They are um, building their own honeypot dis distribution kind of thing where they dockered a lot of the honeypots. So if you're interested in uh, Docker images for common honeypots, have a look at their uh, GitHub repository for this. But generally what you want to have is a way to have customization supplied and to have rapid updates available. And these are two things that are qu quite hard to do manually, 
text at least in a um, repeatable way because remember they are these are throwaway systems so you will reinstall them quite a lot or rebuild them quite a lot and you really don't want to do that by hand trust me I'd, i i've been there i did it and it's no fun at all so the pros and cons of Ansible or configuration management versus Docker are always Docker needs a bit more computational power. So especially if you're running on very low cost providers as I do, um, that kind of power tends to be unavailable. And not every honeypot is Dockerized. So configuration management deployments as an ansible for example are tend to be a bit more complex because you have to do more but it also means the, these are more easily customizable so you can automate stuff like picking a random username picking a random host name or stuff like that so that you can make uh, your honeypots really truly random with not that much of work that you put in and customization is the main thing. That's why what I talked about on, in the beginning with, um, yeah, with uh, with talking about honeypot tweaks. So most of the attacks out there are automated, um, which means they are trying to find defaults. So. Kauri, the SSH honeypot for a long time had a default host name and at some point in time uh, scripts or automated attacks started checking for this host name or for the default users that are in there. So what you can do is try to uh, change the low hanging fruit. So usernames, passwords, uh, version strings and generally try to make it look as real as you can. Think of a MongoDB or a, a big database cluster. They don't run on like 256 megabytes of RAM or something like that. So try to, to, uh, try to emulate a real production system as far as you can, because that makes it more of a valuable target and harder, harder to detect. And all in all, it's kind of a cat and mouse game. And if you would be interested in seeing a little bit more or hearing a little bit more about honeypot detection and, break, and how to break them or how easy it is sometimes to break and find them, there is a CCC talk that I would heavily recommend called Breaking Honeypots for Fun and Profit, where the uh, speakers go into meticulous detail on, on a quite entertaining story of how they broke different honeypots. So definitely a recommendation for you if you're interested in this. So we're now at the point of, we've talked about why I want this, uh, where I would deploy it and how I would deploy it. So we have kind of a production state, right? Well, your honeypots look like this. So they log logs. So you see these logs and I have to say, these are not fun to work on by hand. So if you're running one or two honeypots, that kind of works. But especially if, if the uh, numbers tend to be, get bigger, it's not fun to go through logs every single time because logs aren't made for human consumption. Nice graphics are made for human consumption. So what you could do is, or what I recommend is, you take this haystack of semi-structured log data and pump it into something like Splunk or Elasticsearch to visualize uh, in a nice way and, and in a human readable way uh, what's happening. This makes it so much more easy to get a quick grasp on what's happening in your network. So you take all your logs, you build some nice Splunk dashboards, but still, you've got the problem of noise. You, you need to be aware of this because especially as most attacks are automated, they tend to generate a lot of noise. If you take this list of files that were generated on the SSH honeypot, you will see that the hashes uh, differ extremely between every single connection. But if you take a closer look, you see that all these files have the same target file name. So in analyzing your data and trying to find patterns in it, you can try to cut through the noise and make your dashboards more valuable. So 
you have your dashboards, but you still have to run around and collect um, collect the payloads by hand at this point. So you see something nice in your dashboard, you click around, you look around, you triage and you decide, I want to investigate this payload. You still have to go connect to this honeypot, pull that payload down to your system and analyze it. So wouldn't it be nice to have something that automatically uploads payloads to a central kind of yeah malware zoo or a central collection? And this is where we go a little bit more into detail on what kind of infrastructure I build. So we start with the four kinds of honeypots we have currently running. So this is a team effort of a friend of mine and me. And we have Kauri as, a, as an SSH honeypot, ADB honey, which emulates uh, the Android debug bridge, Camera Obscura, which is a custom-made IoT honeypot, and Mailpot, which, as the name might suggest, is an email honeypot we also written ourselves. So these all pull their log or push the logs into Splunk, which then generates some nice dashboards with direct links to VirusTotal, Shodan, and Graynoise to assist you in triaging. So you can just click on things and it opens the correct tab right away. So this is the first part of having dashboards, but we also implemented um, payload uploads. So for example, if we take Kauri, if an attacker uh, uses a payload or, or uploads a payload, it gets automatically uploaded to a MISP instance we're running. So all the, um, all the events generate MISP, uh, MISP cases that you can then investigate. And MISP has, is quite an impressive tool, about, uh, especially regarding enrichments. But there is also a second tool that is even more impressive or works better for our workflow at least, which is called Hive. And uh, they even have a MISP integration so that you can sync uh, your data between MISP and Hive. So this is more or less the whole infrastructure that we built. And I'm, I have talked about this quite a bit, so let's have a look at it. Be advised, this looks smaller than it usually would be because these are the uh, testing and staging systems. These are not production systems, just to be sure that I don't leak anything important or that I shouldn't be leaking publicly. So what you can see here is that we have quite the basic dashboard that already gives us a general grasp of what's happening in the network. And if we take the honeypot, the, the SSH honeypot, for example, you can see that, let's say we have this SHA hash that we're interested in. So we see this, is, this was uploaded uh, some, yeah, an hour ago on one of the honeypots. And we can just click on this and it will open the virus total um, link with the con with the hash that I clicked on, which is kind of uh, yeah, at least kind of a quick way of doing things. And then you can also have a look at the source IP and think, okay, what is running on this source IP? And you end up at Shodan with a click. So. This is the kind of triage I was talking about. So you don't have to manually copy and paste around things. So let's say we're interested in what this kind of payload is, even though VirusTotal um, did not recognize it as something directly malicious. So we can then have a look at the MISP instance and see that the malware sample was already uploaded here. And the interesting thing about this sample is it's not only uploaded, but it's also available. So you could download this and analyze it right away on your, uh, on your um, yeah, reverse engineering system or yeah, on your detonation system. And you can even make use of all the integrations that MISP gives you. For example, all the third party tools that you can uh, connect to your MISP instance. But as I said, we also are using Hive, which gets automatically synced. So it gets alerts 
from with case files from MISP and uh, from yeah from MISP. And as you can see, it already has a reference embedded with the um, yeah basically with the um, MISP case number. And what we can do is, um, why would you do all this? Why would you go through all this, this trouble? What we're doing with this is we are, um, you can define checkboxes, you can define workflows, and even partly automate all the um, basic lookups that you can do. So for example, if we take this SHA hash, we can already have a look at the virus total report and just query it. So these are the kinds of uh, automation, or this is uh, the, the, the level of automation that I'm interested in, because especially if you need to go through a lot of payloads or a lot of information quickly, this simply assists you and gives you more information and cuts down the time that you need to do an initial triage or decide if you want to take a closer look or not. So going back to the, um, to the automation and infrastructure itself, how is this done? So how do you get honeypots to upload their stuff to Splunk or how do you get them to upload your payload to MISP? Well, let's have a look at Kauri because that's uh, the prime example that is very nice to see and, and look uh, and talk about. So how, does, how this works is most honeypots are plugin based. So there are input and output plugins. In the case of Kauri, these are, out, uh, these are output plugins. And as you can see, I'm using two output plugins, namely the Splunk HTTP event collector and the MISP event creation. So these are first party plugins created by the, uh, the authors or the community itself. So you don't need third party tools to make this happen or no, not even third party scripts. You just add some, some uh, yeah, yeah you, you add your authentication into the Kauri config and it starts uploading things. So my recommendation would be if you evaluate honeypots for your own network, try to uh, try to favor honeypots that are extensible and customizable. Prefer ha modular honeypots. So just to give you an idea, Curry is one of the older um, and better, yeah, better maintained projects. And more output plugins, for example, include Apache Kafka, MongoDB, S3 buckets. You can even get it to post to Slack or even automatically upload payloads to VirusTotal. So there is a lot of functionality right built in into this thing. And as long as you keep it up to date, which with Ansible or Docker is quite easy, um, you always uh, have the benefit of up-to-date features and bug fixes. So yeah, that concludes at least the um, yeah the technical stuff. The maybe more one might say even boring things, but I also have some fun stuff for you to maybe get you get this closed with a little grin. So. Let's talk about the things that I did wrong or that happened to me in the process of doing this because I'm, I've been deploying honeypots for multiple years now. So what happens quite often is uh, I just want to connect to the honeypot host and do some quick maintenance as in OS updates or updating something else. And I'm wondering why my SSH key isn't working. I know it's the right password and the right key. So yeah. After a short investigation, I reset all my passwords and keys, scrub all of my data out of the Splunk dashboards, and you might have guessed it by now. Um, I connected to the SSH honeypot and not to the host that is running it. So yeah, clean up on aisle five, try to get rid of the chaos again. What also happened to me is um, I had all my infrastructure up and running. And then I was hit by a debt pooling attack. So as I'm paying for this with my own money and not company money, I tried to stick to very low cost providers, which ended up um, 
being a debt pooling scam. So a lot of these providers take money, take payments in advance for a year or more. And uh, some of them just took that money and ran away. So yeah, infrastructure gone, data, f thankfully the data was there and I had automation. So it's very short bootstrapping times, but especially if you imagine you have 15 to 20 honeypots and you're all installing and configuring them manually, that's days worth of work. Speaking of backups, so I thought about, yeah, let's move Splunk to another host. I forgot to check the backups, deleted the old instance and had no backups. And at least it seems I'm not the only one that uh, this happened to. So recommendation from my side, as with everything, check your automation, check your backups. As long as you haven't tested it, it's not verified working. Another thing that I would strongly recommend against is deploy your honeypots to system Python. Always, or at least in the case of Python, try to use virtual environments because the next time you do a system update, everything is broken if you get unlucky and use uh, system dependencies that get updated by apt update. So that's also something that happened. Um, I see, I, I saw that my honeypots were, or someone tried to log into to my honeypots with lots of interesting new passwords that I haven't seen before. And I just uh, mass copied and pasted them into the database or in the configuration file that allows that yeah that allows or denies uh, access to systems based on passwords and i ended up um, breaking it because i did a copy and paste and pa pasted some weird symbols with uh, that that i copied with, over with so yeah ideally try to verify your config is running and not wait for one and a half weeks and wondering why nothing is happening on the honeypots anymore. And finally, or one of the biggest problems, uh, as, as I've told uh, in the beginning, please don't try to run them as root because if there is an escape, the attacker already has system privileges and doesn't need to, and does not need to, uh, yeah, need to elevate privileges. So the only thing that you should do when this happens is nuke it, just reinstall it and it's fine. And also a general recommendation for you, monitor your honeypots. So that would at least uh, alleviate some of the problems like storages and services, as well as um, are these services up and running? Are the ports open? Is port forwarding working as intended? You can do quite a lot with uh, systemd, for example, or Docker, um, Docker monitoring. And also do yourself the favor, clean your payloads and logs on a regular basis because something like this happens. And it actually happens more than I would like to admit because I'm lazy and I'm not cleaning automatically. So my honeypots tend to just, um, yeah, <clears throat> flow over. But the good thing is as logs and payloads get sent away, it's not that big of a problem. Expect maybe the fact that they, um, yeah, they don't accept new connections anymore. But I'm not the only one making interesting mistakes. So the attackers, uh, what, what, you, what you start to see is attackers also doing, yeah, well, interesting things. For example, if you look at this, this is my SMTP honeypot and this is the connection count that you see. What happens is, do you see this barely noticeable spike? Well, someone connected to my honeypot roughly 250 times within two minutes and did nothing else than just connecting. No, nothing else, just connecting. So it, it, it feels a little bit like, am I doing something wrong or is, is, the, is, is the people, is the system connecting to my system something, doing something wrong? And also what you tend to see a lot is um, 
wrong configured uh, honey yeah wrong configured scripts so this is uh, user and password com combinations and you see that um, yeah that support and an IP address not a username and password and we can can continue this with yeah basically system commands that are fired off in the login in the login prompt or even just the uh, any header called login where you can see well maybe you should provide actual login data and not your configuration part that should hold it and also sometimes it's it's very interesting to see what people try to do as in they try to download your uh, they don't try to download the payload and yeah that's not the address you're looking for most likely so it's it's an it's it's this literal string that was uh, used there and also something very interesting happens uh, from time to time more on the android debug uh, honeypot than on any other pots because usually i am very interested in the payloads that attackers try to upload right so yeah that that's one of the main reasons i'm i'm trying to i'm i'm running these all these honeypots so what usually happens is the attacker uploads one file tries to execute it doesn't work Maybe a second file doesn't work as well. And yeah, but then there's people that are just uploading all the payloads in a Hail Mary, which is very interesting for me because this uh, spares me a lot of work, especially in manually crawling or looking around for other payloads they might be using. So yeah, also very interesting. And there's another thing that that was very very interesting for me especially uh with the rise of uh yeah different uh deployment platforms think of our iot honeypot it has uh, it also logs user agents that you connect with and keep in mind these are easily forgeable so i wouldn't give too much to to them but you see some interesting things like um nice greetings from other researchers or even information about the connecting system and then you find a kubectl and i really hope that no one was connecting or that that i i really hope that there is no rogue kubectl that is running around connecting to to stuff hopefully and finally the um, the connection, uh, the uh, the payload uh, hash I used to show you the infrastructure is actually this SSH key. This is something that I would have missed if I would have just crawled logs manually. So this is an SSH key that is uh, being spread since December last year. It is still being spread actively as of right now. And to date, I have received it from over a thousand different source IPs. So this is a very, this is a prime example of why it can be interesting to have uh, honeypots just listening to what's happening in the internet. Because if you find this SSH key on your infrastructure, you might uh, ask the incident response team nicely to take a closer look at your infra infrastructure because that shouldn't be there because it's actually, yeah, well, deployed by someone else that is trying to deploy it to the whole internet. Which brings me to my conclusion. So for me, I'm telling you, you should deploy honeypots today because they are low cost, low maintenance and give you high value. So at least for the um, cost to, to work ratio. So they tend to give you deeper insights into what's happening or what is possibly threatening your uh, infrastructure that you have publicly in the internet. So don't hold back. And to get you started, I have prepared you some links and resources. So the honeypots that a friend of mine and I are developing, as well as all these Splunk dashboards that I showed you, and even more of them, you can find there. 
and you can find uh, some of the honey pots that I would highly recommend running, especially if you want to have a general grasp uh, of how to get up and running quite quickly. Have a look at Teapot, which is uh, the, the telecom uh, honey pot distribution that you can basically just download, start in a VM and it's up and running. So they took a lot of time and inv invested a lot of time into building a very, very interesting and compelling system that is a bit harder to customize than rolling your own, but it's already there, even with all the dashboards. So if you just look at one thing, maybe look at Teapot and start there, maybe. And if you have questions about this, please feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, you won't be mauled, I promise. <laughs> Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Matthias, uh, for this excellent and interesting presentation, for explaining how to bypass all those typical mistakes. Thanks for sharing your experience. I hope that there will be questions and they will be directed to you. Thank you for joining us, Matthias. Goodbye.